Good evening uh, 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 and welcome. Uh, I, my name is Tim Knox and I have the great honour to be the director of the Centre for Policy Studies. It's wonderful to see so many new and old faces here this evening uh, 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 to celebrate George's great new book. Um, he's a Renaissance man, you will find by, by, by reading this book. Chairman of the Royal Philip Monarch the Society, uh, very successful businessman with, 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 with consolidated gold fields, and of course a, a, a deeply influential policy advisor, uh, number 10, uh, 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 under Margaret Thatcher's uh, uh, days. Um, he provides a brilliant day-to-day -day picture of life at number 10 with Margaret Thatcher. Uh, the, just one example. Uh, uh, there was a question of when it came to the privatisation of uh, British Steel, uh, and the question was: should it be privatised as a single unit, as a monopoly, or should it be broken up and sold off in smaller bits and pieces? Um, George was sent off to the United States to see to interview various steel magnates there to see what their opinion was, and he comes back. And I quote, I was back within a week, and even before I had time to pen a report, Mr. Thatcher stopped me in the corridor. Well, what did your American friends say? I replied that they agreed with her. The British steel should indeed be broken up. She paused for a while, and then said, that means that I'm wrong. If that's what the competition wants. So not only a Renaissance man, but a, a man who persuades Mrs. Thatcher that she's wrong. So there is obviously quite a lot behind George's great stuff. He's also a brilliant expose of, of, of the failure of big government. No senior civil servant at that time had anything more than a O-level science degree, and yet they were deciding science policy until George came over and knocked some sense into them. Uh, the, the wonderful passages which illustrate a complete failure to understand very basic business concepts of working capital, cash flow, value of businesses. All exemplified, and another example of the extraordinary failure of government of uh, 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 big investments in infrastructure, as we like to call them now, uh, but exemplified by a story which I haven't read before on the prototype fast breeder reactor. <coughs> had a £3.5 billion pound investment in a £100 million pound annual running cost, and it provided £12 million pounds of a worth of electricity every year. Um, <laughs> here is government at its, at its finest, obviously. So do buy this book to read more about this. Uh, but also, those of you who are new here, um, you will find, um, as part of the book, of course, uh, 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 an invitation to become an associate member of the CPS, which means that you will uh, 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 receive invitations to all our events. We have something fantastic lined up on Monday evening at the, with the Institute of Directors, uh, but it means you receive all our fantastic pamphlets uh, and you support an organisation of which George is himself one of our oldest and one of our most esteemed members. George, thank you. Uh, I, I, I looked through the records and you are not on. <laughs> but George, thank you. <clears throat> I recently returned from South Africa where there are daily power cuts all because the government refused to follow advice in the 90s and privatise. They told me then that electricity supply was so vital to the country that it could not be left to the vagaries of the market. As Alaric the Goth said before the sack of Rome, against stupidity, even the eternal gods are powerless. <laughs> it's not only the South African government, but today we often hear criticism of privatization from those with short enough memories to believe that the state can operate more efficiently than the dreaded profit-making private sector People who are naive enough to believe that a command structure with a government minister at one end and a school janitor at the other mm -hmm. can deliver efficiency. 
if the long-term price trend from pre-privatization monopolistic days is extrapolated, then a phone call to New York today would cost over a hundred pounds a minute. A household fuel bill would be far higher as uneconomic mines were kept open and miners were paid whatever their unions demanded. However, the coalition government is doing its best to reverse this by imposing crazy EU emissions targets, regardless of cost to the consumer. Where's Rupert Darvel? Read Rupert's wonderful, marvellous paper, his marvellous analysis, which has recently been published by the CPS. If the EU issued a directive that all member state ministers should wear paper hats, I suspect Britain would be the first to comply. <laughs> An Austin Montego would cost more than a Mercedes, which wouldn't really matter because nobody, however loyal to Britain, would buy one. <laughs> Nevertheless, the state would continue to build them rather than upset Red Robbo. Remember Red Robbo? No. The word privatization is currently used equivocally, especially by the left, who argue that if the state uses profit-driven efficient resources in its efforts to deliver value for money, it is privatizing the organization which uses them. And the Conservative Party is so terrified of the word that it does nothing to expose this lie. I don't care if it's popular, is it right? Yeah. How often did we hear that, Charles? <laughs> Archie? No. How often did we hear that in the policy unit, too? Sorry, Brian Griffiths isn't here tonight. He couldn't be. He's in America. What political leader says and means that today? The leaders of the main parties, except one, seem to think that erecting windmills is more important than dealing with Russia or eliminating ISIS. Inside the tank is about how Thatcher took advice and acted upon it. It may surprise you to hear that she was the best listener with whom I ever worked. Possibly, Rudolph, you were a tie with her. Thank you. My, uh, my, uh, my, my former chairman at Cons Gold is here tonight. What raised the handbag was arguments based on self-interest and defense of the status quo. She was not in the least surprised that the main opponents of pet passports raising specters of mass rabies all over Britain were dog and cat's home owners between <laughs> London and Dover. <laughs> in my view, she never thought of herself as part of the government at all but as somebody that the taxpayer had elected to make sure that the government did its job without screwing up. She once told me that Thatcherism was an invention of people like Alan Walters and Keith Joseph. She claimed to look at every issue on its own merits without ever fitting it into a preconceived mould. This book, which is largely about the privatisation of much of British industry and how she revolutionised government science policy, describes how Margaret Thatcher took advice, made decisions, and persuaded. <clears throat> she once told me that if you wish to reverse a ship's direction, you should never tell the naysayers how far you intend to go, because they can only deal with 15 degrees at a time. <laughs> Compared with the many other works which have appeared since her death, it is quite thin, as it contains only live accounts of her words and actions. I leave the philosophy to others. This book is quite short, although it's ten times longer than the American Declaration of Independence. <laughs> it's also very cheap. It's, so it's, it's a very good value. A very good value. <laughs> so I can't think of any good reason for not buying one. Thank you all for coming. If I can help with any 
sort of questions about the time I was in the policy unit. For those who may have read it or skimmed through it, I'm happy to do so. Anything? What? Judith? I didn't have a question, George. No, it's not a question. Do you have any questions? <laughs> the question is, does anyone have any questions? Uh, Tony. Could I ask, um, here we are in 2015, and you, you focused on electricity and energy. Which other area disappoints you so much, given what was done in the late 1980s and early 90s, where it has gone wrong, government has re-emerged, perhaps in a worse way than it ever could have done before, all, the, all these years later? Well, we didn't do railways, but um, John Major did shortly afterwards. Mm. And the railway situation is, is a bit of a mess. Um, I think the... What's that dreadful woman with a voice like a corn crake from Australia, which she called? Um, the green woman. The green that's woman. Yeah, that's that. right. <laughs> she thinks they should be taken back into national mm. ownership. But well, the railways is the only one I can think of which is a really as, as, as bad. I mean, the, the telecoms was privatized as a single entity, which was probably a mistake. But um, I have to say that was before my time. <laughs> um, I can't think of any others which were real disasters. George, I remember you um, ah. say, saying that uh, you always um, gave your so you always wanted one, you always uh, uh, reserved one good argument with Margaret Thatcher a year. Um, which was your most exciting argument? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't have argue with her much, ex except on 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 on, on two, two two major issues. One was whether Britain should remain a member of CERN, and that comes out in the book. And the other was one was whether. British steel should be broken up into component parts and privatised individually, separately. And those are the only two. Arguments. And I won both, yes, that's true. <laughs> um, and there were, there were a number of occasions when she didn't follow my advice, but she was always courteous enough to explain why. She said, I think you're probably right commercially, but I can't <coughs> deliver this. I can't handle it. <coughs> You go to the dispatch box. You tell them <laughs> that we're going to close every shipyard in Britain on Tuesday afternoon. You know? <laughs> Next one. John. Um, George, the, the Electricity Network and Rupert's uh, CPS publication makes a very good point, I think, about corporatism. Yeah. And whether the use of corporations essentially as arms of government yeah. is actually the worst of all solutions. Are we, in fact, better to keep things either privatised or owned by the state, and this halfway house is actually a very dangerous situation. I'm interested in your comments. I think that if you privatise something without introducing competition, you do more harm to the industry than if you leave it alone as a, as a part of the state. And we nearly made that mistake with Northern Ireland electricity. It may seem a small issue at the moment. Um, I suppose the power of monopoly is not its, or, or the danger of monopoly is not its power to do evil, but its power to be inefficient. So just that sort of put it in context. Can I uh, ask you a question, George, if I may? Yes, um, Stephen. Here we are in 2015, uh, arguably one of the most advanced countries on earth. And there is a serious doubt as to whether we can receive electricity supplies at the end of next year and the beginning of 2017. Uh, the national grid, I'm sure you're aware, is running around the country, signing up every diesel generator that it can spy as a reserve in case the wind doesn't blow in January and February 2016 and 2017. Uh, we are closing coal stations with no obvious replacement in the form of better safety for the power station. And uh, this is under a regime um, which is nominally uh, free enterprise, but steered by the state in various directions. Is there anything you can see that would redeem the position and give Britain back the at least the energy stability that it had in the late 80s when Walter Marshall was in charge of the Central Electricity Generating Board, as you, of course, would remember. Well, of course, Walter wanted to have the cake and eat it. He wanted a guaranteed return on capital from, from, from well, the government, basically. He was basically. told to do that. Uh, no, he wasn't. He, he, the, 
the absurd demands that Walter Marshall made when we were thinking of putting the nuclear generators inside national power were dreadful. And uh, when he resigned, we were sad, but we were not sorry. <laughs> well, I didn't want to particularise it to Walter Marshall. I'm rather thinking of the situation we find ourselves in now. Well, the best person to answer that is probably Rupert. As George said, I've written a, a pamphlet on that. The fundamental problem of the renewables and how you isolate those from the other. Yes, I will. I too have written a pamphlet. Yeah. Oh, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I, let's get to the point. Why don't we just say we must abandon emission targets? It's the only way that's going to supply. The energy that well, we I, need. I think we'd all agree with that. I, I think the other thing you have to ban is the renewables targets. Oh, well, that's part of it, yeah. George, can I ask a question? Who, was the, who, in your experience, was the most challenging cabinet minister that Mrs. Thatcher and you had to deal with in terms of getting, getting things going? <laughs> well, I mean, certainly the most intelligent person I ever had to deal with in, in Number 10, apart from officials, apart from people like Charles, was somebody like Nigel Lawson. Uh, he was very clever indeed. Um, whether he was pursuing a false objective, I don't know. I will leave that from other, uh, others. But in terms of sheer brain power and sheer speed and s what the Afrikaners call slim, which means streetwise, he was fantastic. Yes, he was the chancellor that said it didn't matter very much if we ran a balance of payments deficit. And mm. I personally been ranting against this since he said it, and now it's all currency, it's actually coming into the election campaign. So perhaps he wasn't quite as slim as the... Um, Talking about the election campaign, did you hear that wonderful remark of Nick Clegg today? No. Which is that um, you have to have the Lib Dems in government <coughs> because they'll give the Tories a heart and they or the Labour Party a uh, brain. <laughs> Useful uh, store of body parts, then. Yeah. 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 Uh, on, on, on the election campaign, would, 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 would Mrs Thatcher, do you think, have um, uh, refused the debate with Miliband? Or the, Miliband you mean a one-on-one? On one? Yeah, yeah. I've no idea. Um, and she always did when she, she always did. Yeah. I think she would have relished, yes. relished the chance of putting down a grubby Marxist yeah. like that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I have no idea. I don't know what she would have been advised. Charles, do you have a view? Oh, yeah, I have a strong view, yes. yes. She, she refused every yeah. occasion ever to debate the leader of the opposition yeah. outside Parliament yeah. on the grounds and just gave him yeah. publicity. Yeah. Why should she bother with that? So it's the same argument as Cameron's, basically. Any more? Well, if there are no more questions, do buy the book, signed copies available here, and also do please, uh, for those of you who aren't already, uh, 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 sign up to be uh, members of the Centre for Policy Studies. We take no money from government. We rely entirely on the generosity of, 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 of people like you. Uh, so thank you for coming. Uh, stay for a few drinks. But buy George's great book. Thank you very much. <laughs>